You know, we've been talking about God working outside of the church as well as inside of the church, and the door is open for Him to use us. And it's easier than you think. Because you don't have to do it for Him. He'll do it through you if you just yield to Him. And Brent and Priscilla were sharing, or Brent was sharing with me about uh, he and Priscilla and how they had a couple of encounters, one last week and then one today, and ministered to some people. And I just wanted him to share those uh, encounters and tell you what happened. Awesome. Might want to step away from the speaker and may <coughs> buzz you a little. Uh, I just want to say that God is moving. He is moving in this city, man. Um, Lately, my prayer has been to give me and my wife more opportunities to share his gospel and just to just show the love of Christ to people and look for opportunities to pray for people and whatever, whatever he wants. But uh, the other night, uh, we went into uh, De Chico's, and it's always at a time where you don't expect it. You know, that, like that just so, that's so much uh, uh, confirmation that we're always on assignment, like we're never off duty. We're always on assignment. We should always be. And we went into the Chico's and uh, we were going in there just to eat or whatever. And as soon as I walked in, I seen our waitress and I felt like the Lord said, uh, like he wanted me to pray for her and that she was going through a lot of worry. So um, can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. And uh, so uh, anyway, so we sat down and, you know, she took our order and everything. And uh I was just, I was kind of nervous, you know, it was like, I told my wife, it was like, I was asking her out on a date in high school, like, you know, when you're all goofy and, you know, and it was like, uh, so every time I would come, she would come through, I, I was going to do it now, and then I would just like, I don't know, anyway, so finally at the end of our meal, I just, I told her, I said, hey, um, I, don't, I don't mean to be out of line here, I said, but uh, I said, I, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said that you, I said, you've been dealing with a lot of, a lot of worry. And she just starts, I mean, bawling. I mean, she was bawling so, like, loud that people were coming out of the back like we were doing something to her or something, you know. I mean, it was just like, it was, it was crazy. So, anyway, so um, when she kind of got calmed down enough, I was just telling her, you know, I said, I'd really like to pray for you and everything. And um, anyway, so I ended up praying for her. And then she kind of got calmed down again. And then she started talking about why. Uh, she what what she had she had just lost her grandmother and I guess she was like a best friend to her and from what I understood uh, she lived with her her grandmother or whatever and now she doesn't know what she's gonna do and she's been worrying and just all all this stuff and so Priscilla starts sharing with her about how she lost her father and um, so anyway so then that just she started just bawling in and Priscilla gave her a hug and then she just completely let it go I mean she said that. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was, you could tell it, it had been there for a while. Like, it was, it was, yeah, like, it was, yeah. And she said afterwards, she said, I, I feel like I needed to do that. She goes, I, she goes, I feel so, um, like, just, like, it was so, like, trapped inside or, or whatever, you know. So then uh, we were getting ready to leave, and I felt like the Lord was telling me to, to bless her. So we, we blessed her with, you know, a, a love offering and everything, and, and anyway, so, yeah, so that, that, that was that. And then uh, today, um, was there another one too? Or was it, oh, I don't know. Anyway, um, so today um, uh, per, we ate at uh, Burger King or whatever. And uh, I'm off the Atkins diet, by the way. So, um, so anyway, uh, so we, <coughs> she goes, hey, you want to go look at shoes over there? And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And because... Um, my wife has very pretty feet, and she wanted to look at shoes for it or whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, um, anyway, so we go in there, and, like, I, again, like, it's like I'm not even thinking I'm going, not going I think we're going there just to look at shoes. And uh, so I'm just kind of sitting around, with this, this lady came over to help us a couple times because there's, like, a coupon you can get online, and anyway. So, um so she, I'm kind of talking to her a little bit as Priscilla's looking at shoes and stuff. And uh, and she said, oh, I told Priscilla, I said, um, I said, don't worry, babe. I said, we're too blessed to be stressed. And then I had my suit and everything on. She goes, hey, um, did you just come from church? And I go, I go, yeah, as a matter of fact, we did. And she goes, wow, she goes, how ironic. She goes, I've been looking for a church. And I said, oh, cool, you know, so I start telling her a little bit about this. She goes, I've never even heard of that church. And she's like, I didn't even know that church was there. 
<clears throat> so anyway, I just felt, I just kept feeling like just, just hurt. I, and I felt like the Lord was, was wanting me to pray for or wanting us to pray for her. And, but there was people kept coming in and this and that. So anyway, I just thought, we'll be praying for you. And I hate to say that to people because I have like heard that all my life. And it's like, how many people really do? I mean, I'm not saying people don't. I'm just saying, you know, it's just like something people say. And <clears throat> so anyway, so we got ready to leave. And I said, babe, I really feel like we need to go pray for her. And I really feel like the Lord wants us to give her a lover off- offering too. So anyway, so we go over there and we're, we're sitting in front of the store. And I mean, it's like, it's like the sale of the year or something. It's like nobody, like everybody just keeps coming in. I'm just like, get what you're going to get and go, you know. So uh, anyway, so finally I said, let's just go in there. So it was like by that time there was hardly anybody in there. And she had a couple of cashiers helping her that had came in. Because when we were there just a little bit ago, there was nobody helping her. So I went in. I, we said, our Priscilla went in and said, hey, can you come outside uh, for a second? She said, yeah, yeah. So she came outside. And uh, I was just like, I feel like the Lord wants me or wants us to pray for you. And she's like, oh, she's like, you don't, that would be so awesome. So anyway, so we, we start praying for her and she's, you know, she's crying and everything. And, um, uh, what did she say? I forgot. Yeah. guys hear that yeah so and then when we blessed her with a, a love offering she was just like this just what did she say yeah it's just and now she wants to start coming to this church and everything but and i told her i said well, i'm not trying to we're not trying to you know basically sell you a church we're just i you know, i want to tell you about the lord but if you come to our church that's awesome and i started telling her where it was and she's more than welcome and it was great and everything but uh, and then right after that, Priscilla saw a relative, and uh, she felt led to go over and pray for her. It was right in the same parking lot. I mean, that's how, that's how awesome the Lord is. And so we prayed for him, uh, for him and then uh, we're just waiting for our next assignment. But, um, I mean, man, I'm telling you, I, I, the way the Lord has been working lately, I feel like the more of a prayer life that you have, the more you can hear from him. Not because it's some religious thing that you have to do, but it's because the Lord wants to speak to us and he wants to build that relationship with us. And the whole time, the devil has been throwing everything, he, everything he's got to try to, to try to cause things between me and my wife. And, you know, and I'm not going to say we never get mad at each other because we got mad at each other yesterday, but it didn't last long, you know. And, I mean, I'm just being transparent. I mean, I mean it's not big news. We don't have a perfect marriage. You know what I mean, nobody does. So, I mean, but the thing about it is, I feel like, um, I feel like the Lord has just been dealing with me about salvations lately, and just, and just, not only just salvations, but bringing people to a point to where they're being set up to get that salvation, you know, to, 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 for those seeds to be planted, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm almost done, Pastor, but, um, I'm sorry, I don't like to take up a lot of time, but, um, but I really feel like there's a lot of revelation that I, that I got back when I was at the rescue mission. And the Lord um, is bringing some of that stuff. He's reminding me of some of that stuff that he, that he planted me back then. And it's like, I remember, if I can just share this real quick. I remember he, shared, uh, that he, he brought this to me. And he said, I remember I was praying one time. And he said, when, he, said he goes, when you're praying and when you're going through life, you know, he said, not only, he said, do you, do you march? He said, but you stomp. Because when you, st- when you stomp, not only does it make a, a sound, it makes a vibration. And when it vibrates, it shakes the walls of hell. And it's like, it's, I know it's more of a spiritual type of understanding thing, but I'm starting to understand. Like, he's bringing back things like that to me that at the time I thought I really understood it, you know. And now I'm going, like, there's so much more deeper things to that. And I, I just, man, I, I just can't encourage, I'm not trying to be some big know-it-all up here, believe me, I, I'm not. But at the same time, the more that you step out and the more you realize it's not about you, it's about him, the more he can use you. Because see, that, that, that day at the Chico's, I was debating because I didn't want to make myself look stupid. But you know what, even if I did, what is, it's not about me, it's about him, you know, and the thing about it is, 
is I think about what God pulled me out of. Man, I, I owe him more than my life, man. I mean, I was a no good, whatever, down in the dumps piece of whatever, and he pulled me out, and he is, I mean, within the next six or eight months, me and Priscilla are going to be starting our own business at something. And it's only because of God. It's not nothing to do with me. It's all God. And, and, and I know that because I've seen what I can do. <laughs> and I've seen what I can mess up. And I can also tell you, I can, I, I've seen what God can do. Total transformation. Thank you for letting me share. That's good stuff right there. But you know, the Lord's just wanting us to, to be open to him. Let him direct us whenever he wants to. The Holy Spirit's, you know, and, and you guys begin to pray for open doors, right? Begin to ask God, God, give me those divine appointments. Give me that opportunity. And when you start praying prayers like that, he'll give it to you. Amen. Just like we started decreeing here a couple of weeks ago that this is a hospital and that the angels are bringing people to the hospital and God's directing people here and he's using you to direct them here or however it works. And uh, I believe this morning was a manifestation of, of just a beginning. Like Mike was saying, a beginning of, uh, of what God wants to do. You know, something came to me too over there uh, during worship that there's somebody in here who's been praying for a, for a glimpse of heaven. And God's going to give you that glimpse. He's going to give you that glimpse, whoever you are. Maybe more than one person, I don't know. But he's going to let you, I don't know what that means. I don't know if you're going to have, you know, some big translation type thing. Or if he's just going to open your eyes and let you see. But he's going to give you a glimpse of heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, grab your Bible tonight. Or your cell phone. Or your whatever. And turn over to the book of Revelation with me. To start. We're going to revelate in Revelations. This, tonight, I, you know, the, this is a believers meeting in essence here tonight. We've got believers in the building and, you know, we need to keep ourselves edified and built up. We need to, to have the Lord build his revelation in us. Yes. Just like you grow naturally, your body changes, you know, your hands get bigger than they were and things begin to happen, you know, your bone structure gets bigger. God wants us to grow that way in Jesus. And uh, the scriptures say, it, 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 there's different, different words in the Greek for uh, sons of God. And one of them is uh, the, it's, I think it's weos or something like that's how you pronounce it. It's over in Romans 8. It says, they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And that word sons, if you look it up in the original, it means a mature son. It means someone who has grown up to a point where they can operate, you know, just like they were operating. They're hearing from the Spirit of God. They're being led by the Spirit of God. They're not a new babe, baby Christian, you know, that uh, just is getting started and needs a lot of help and, a, you know, a, a lot of things like that. And there's nothing wrong with being a baby Christian. That's where we all start. Amen. Amen. I was a baby Christian for many years. Never grew much, and it was because I didn't, put myself in a position to grow. I didn't adhere to the discipleship teaching that Jesus uh, tells us that we need to have. You know, it's amazing to me, and I guess, you know, whatever, I, I'm not trying to beat people up or whatever, but it's amazing to me how many Christians don't cultivate their spiritual life. They leave it to somebody else. And I did that for years, but it was, a lot of it was because I didn't know to. You know, I heard, read your Bible and pray. To me, it was more like, you know, do this religious duty so God will be happy with you. But really what that's about is reading your Bible, spending time with the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit, praying, having a relationship with God, is because then you can grow, you can become a disciple. And the Bible says that you'll, you'll not just uh, know about his word, you'll know or you'll become one, is what it means in, the, in that word, with his word. And that, tr that word will set you free. That truth of that word will set you free. Yes. Amen. But a lot of Christians, they, all they do is, well, you know, I'll go to church and hear what the pastor has to say, or I'll watch my favorite you know, TV preacher or something a little bit, but they don't cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit through the Word and, and uh, you know, with the Father 
by per- pursuing a relationship. And we know how to do that. All of us know how to pursue a relationship. Someone we want to get to know or be around or someone you know, we fall in love with and we pursue them to be our spouse or something like that. When you have that kind of heart about God, you're going to cultivate your relationship, your, your spiritual relationship or your spiritual man. You're going to grow spiritually. You can be strong physically and weak spiritually. You can be strong spiritually and weak physically. Amen? So it's important that we, you know, I don't, I don't get up in the morning and, and uh, spend time with the Lord just to try to, you know, make points with God. I do it because I need to grow. Until I'm exactly like Jesus, I'm not done growing. Now I'm thankful for where I'm at and, and you know, where, where I'm walking with the Lord, but there's, there's still more. So always cultivate your spiritual walk with the Lord. Amen? Praise God. I want to talk tonight about uh, defeating demonic giants in your life. Uh, And a a demonic giant, did I tell you to turn over to Revelation? Did I tell you where? Revelation 1. See, if you were in the spirit, you would have known that that was... uh, I'm just kidding, come on. Just kidding, just kidding. Revelation chapter 1. A demonic giant. What is a demonic giant? Well, a good example is Goliath. Goliath was, and, and there's, I don't want to get too, too off into the depth of this thing about who Goliath was, because there, according to Genesis 6 and what the scriptures say over there about an intermingling of the sons of, uh, the, the, son, uh, the daughters of men and the sons of God, uh, there's basically two schools of thought. There are people that believe that there was a literal fallen angelic element to that where angels intermingled with women and brought forth these uh, beings who uh, had a, a mixture of the angelic and the human uh, you know, race. And so they were giants and they, they had all these, uh, these uh, weird things that were different than the intended plan of God for man and the way man was. And... Um, that's one school of thought. We won't go into it any further. And then the other school of thought is that people that weren't of the covenant of God are following God, uh, the daughters of men, that the sons of God intermingled with them. And there was like this uh, righteous, uh, you know, strain of people or a seed of people who were following God that intermingled with people who weren't and all that kind of thing. But the point is, is that Goliath was something different than what God had intended. I, to be honest, and, and I'm not telling you you have to believe this, I believe more the, the first uh, scenario that I have given you. And the reason I believe that, I didn't used to believe it, but I've done a lot of study and a lot of research, and I'm convinced that there was a penetration into uh, the earth by the fallen angels. The Bible talks about uh, them leaving their original place as a watcher, as a watcher angel and coming into the earth and actually being used. And it only makes sense if you think about the devil. The devil tries to duplicate everything God has done. So what God did was he created man and woman in his own image. They had his nature and, and life inside them. So the enemy is, tried through those fallen angelic beings, I believe, to raise up those beings in his image. He tried to He can't create people. He can't create beings. He's a fallen angel. So he tried to encroach on what God had done and bring mixture because he knew that God couldn't honor that mixture. Amen? And uh, anyway, well, I've probably gotten too far off into that more than I wanted to. But the point is this, is that Goliath showed up and Goliath, the word, the name Goliath means soothsayer. Look at your neighbor and say soothsayer. What is a soothsayer? A soothsayer is a perversion of the prophetic gift. A soothsayer is someone who prophesies your future or even tells you about your past or tells you about things. But a soothsayer is not one who's being used of the Holy Spirit to share with you things that are going to edify you and give you God's direction. They're sharing supernatural information that they have in order to deceive you and control you and dominate you. And when David and Goliath, when the confrontation took place between them, David came forward 
the, the Bible says Goliath looked at him and disdained him and, and hated him. And it says he, he cursed him by his gods. He tried to use the God that Goliath that he was serving and he tried to put a curse on David. And he started saying to David, I'm, you know, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to this and I'm going to that. He was a soothsayer. He was releasing a prophetic curse, a perverted prophetic curse. We call it today occultism, witchcraft, whatever term you want to use to try to get David, you know, into that place of fear to where he could be defeated easily. And so a, a demonic giant in our life today is anything that looks bigger than us, insurmountable, undefeatable through natural human means and probably is undefeatable through natural human means. But how many of you know we don't have to depend on natural human means? Amen. We've got the greater one with us. Like Elisha told his servant, there's more with us than there are with them. Amen. You've always got the devil outnumbered. Just, just having God in your life, you've got him out everything. Yes. Amen? Yes. And so David, being a covenant man, understanding not only that he had a covenant, but some other things that we'll talk about a little bit about tonight, he, instead of just standing there saying, did you hear what the devil said? Oh, did you hear what the devil, oh, did you, hear, you see what the devil's doing? David said, you come at me with a sword and a shield and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Most High God. Amen. 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 And he told the soldiers, uh, the Israeli soldiers before he went out there, he said, who, is, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? He doesn't have a covenant with God. He's uncircumcised. He doesn't have the Abrahamic covenant. Amen. And so David understood that I don't care how big, bad, and ugly the circumstances are or the being is or the situation is. It is a false demonic appearance and manifestation that is defeatable by a person who knows their God. God intends for us to walk in victory. Now look here in Revelation chapter 1. Let's go ahead and look at verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. So now he's talking to New Testament churches, isn't he? This was after Jesus died, went back to heaven. Actually John, his disciple John is who's writing this. John was a very old man when he wrote this. He was put on the Isle of Patmos by Rome because they tried to martyr him in boiling oil and he didn't boil. Amen. The Holy Ghost fire on him was hotter than the fire that they put on under that oil. And that totally freaked him out. They didn't know what to do. So all they, they just banned him. They put him on this island, tried to you know, get him out of here. They were afraid probably to try to touch him again. So John's over there. He, you know, he, get, he becomes encountered with Jesus, writes the the revelation, but he's talking to New Testament church. You are in the New Testament church. This is as much for you as it was for the seven churches in Asia. Now we got to get that. Amen. Verse five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. If you read uh, the book of, of uh, Hebrews in the first chapter or two, you see where Jesus, when he went to heaven, he was brought into a place at the, at the right hand of the Father on the throne of God. He was uh, uh, given a position as a king. Jesus himself said when he rose from the dead, all might and authority, all power and authority are given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he was seated next to his father on the throne. He was given that position of king of kings and lord of lords over all. And that's why it says here in verse 5, he's the prince of the kings of the earth. He's higher than any king. Amen. Amen. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I love that. Yes. Verse 6. And. Everybody say and. Amen. Hath made us kings and priests unto our God and his father. To him be glory and dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now it's easy to get excited about that and see all that's happened to Jesus. But the Bible says here in verse 6 that he has made us, and the scriptures say it in other places, he's made us a joint heir with him. We have the same position that he has. We're not Jesus, but we're a part of who he is. 
Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 12, talking about the body of Christ, the corporate body of Christ made up of many people. And it, he says over there that we all have a place in that body, that God doesn't look at you and me as just a scattered group of people. He sees us in Christ. He sees us corporately as being in him. And the Bible says we are joint heirs with Christ. What he's inherited, we've inherited. So God doesn't just see Jesus seated on the throne. He sees you seated on the throne in him. Amen. You know, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When God created Adam and Eve, he, said, he created them in his image, in him basically, gave them life, breathed his nature into them, and then he said, take dominion. God has always been a king. He's always been the king and the ruler and the highest one. And he, when he created Adam and Eve, he gave them a position of rulership over the planet that he put them in to serve him in and to, to follow him in. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And one of the messages the devil wants to hide, and doesn't want Christians to know, is the, the message of authority and dominion that we have over the works of darkness. Yeah. And that's why it seems like if the church goes to sleep, doesn't do anything, you know, like we're supposed to do, we just kind of start living life like everybody else on this earth, the devil starts taking over. Why? Because there's nobody to stop him on earth. God gave dominion to mankind. In order, and when mankind sinned and let the devil in as the God little g of this world that works through deception of the minds of people and rules and reigns through that deception, manipulating people and having them through the spirit of fear and deception to serve him and do what he wants them to do, which eventually ends up in self-destruction. Right. Read the book of Revelation, you'll see it. When that happens and the church doesn't respond to that, there's no one to, to do anything because God has given mankind dominion in the earth and he's not going to just jump in and do it for them. He can't. He would have to violate his word and he'd be an unjust God. And that's why Jesus had to have a human body prepared for him, put into the earth to pass all the tests that Adam and Eve failed and then literally give himself up as a perfectly innocent man for us and when he had suffered what we should have suffered in being separated from God and so forth and so on, not just the physical things, but the spiritual things, he then came to a place where the Father says the price has been paid for them. You, this man does not deserve to stay in hell. And not only that, he's paid the price for everyone else, so they don't have to go there. And so he raised him from the dead, demonstrating the victory that Jesus obtained for us and raised Jesus up and put him in that place of authority as the head of the body of Christ, expecting us to understand that now we've been raised up into a place where we can walk in the same dominion with him over the devil. So if the church doesn't do something about the devil on the earth, the devil will just run nuts and crazy. Amen. You hear people say, well, God's in control. Well, he is in control. I mean, there's some things that are inevitable. Let's, let's, for instance, God knows how long the earth is going to exist. And whether you believe that or not, or you pray or not, it's going to happen. But when it comes to your personal sovereignty and and willful decisions that you can make because God's made you a free moral agent to make your decisions, you can give, I don't care if you are a born-again Christian, you can live in a way to open the door to the devil and he can be in your life deceiving you and even destroying you through that deception, even though God is your God and you can walk around saying, walk around saying God's in control and he's not in control. Right. It's up to you who you yield to and give control in your life. You know, people use that little control card all the time. Something bad happens, well, God's in control. Well, if he is, he's doing a lousy job in the earth. He's letting, you know, little innocent children be murdered. He's letting people starve to death. And here we go around preaching he's love and he's letting all that happen. No, he's not letting all that happen. People are letting that happen. Amen? We have to make a decision. That's why we need to preach the gospel to people in other nations that the enemy's been able to dominate through wrong belief systems. It's not about fighting with people over who's right or who's wrong. 
It's about getting the devil out of that situation and God into that situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why I don't, want, I, want, I don't want any door of my heart open to the enemy. I want to be quick to repent when I get in the flesh or I step out of line in some way. I don't walk around feeling guilt laden and, you know, and all of that kind of thing because I know Jesus has applied his blood to my life and I've been made the righteousness of God. And it's not about me as a human and my humanity. He understands who I am. He's given me that position. But right on the other hand, if I take some wrong heart attitude about things and I, I decide in my heart to have a wrong motive toward God or toward somebody else, I have opened the spiritual door and the enemy now has access to deceive me, to blind my eyes, to close off my ears, to harden my heart. And if I stay that way very long, I'll be walking around and be, being slapped in the face with the truth and not even recognize it as truth. I didn't plan on saying all this tonight. But it's true. So verse 6 says he's made us kings and priests and he expects us. Praise God. To operate as a king. The priest is another thing we're not really talking about tonight. I want to talk about confronting these giants. Now, back in 2010, the Lord began to talk to me and he told me I didn't know him very well as king. And he began to teach me about him being king. There's a, in the scripture, many, many times, there's a phrase, uh, Lord of hosts, is what it, it says in the King's James, if you read it. Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. And in the original language, it's Jehovah Sabaoth, I believe is how you pronounce it. And it means what, exactly what it says. It's a God who everything he has created, even the weather, he can use as a weapon or as a soldier. Amen. He's not only a loving Heavenly Father, he's not only a healer, he's not only a teacher, but he is a king who will make war against his enemies if he has to and, and defeat them to keep them from destroying his family. Yes. Amen. Well, I, don't, I just don't believe God would destroy people. What would you do if somebody was trying to destroy your family? Sit over on the couch and say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, I wonder what you are. If you love your family, you'll defend them. God makes war out of love. Now, he's not, you know, going around just looking for somebody, you know, and this is kind of the idea I got as growing up as a kid, is that, you know, he's like this God that's walking around with his big, you know, club waiting for me just to make a mistake. Boom! You know, that's not how he is. He loves us. He overlooks lots of things in our ignorance, many things that, that we're ignorant of and, way, and concepts we have in our mind. He, his love for us is the predominant thing. It's the same way with me and my family. I don't look at my children and grandchildren and, well, are they absolutely correct in everything? I love them. Now, if, maybe I need to speak correction to them a little, or I need to, you know, comfort them and uh, encourage them or whatever. But my love is the predominant thing, not whether they're absolutely right all the time. And it's the same way with God with us. Amen? But he's a God who is a king. And in 2010, he began to teach me about his kingship. And, you know, and I began to see certain things about him as Lord Saboeth and all that kind of thing. And you see, if you study the Bible, you'll find that the next era that we come into in the earth, if you follow the timeline of the scriptures, we are at the end of the end of, uh, end of days. We are right toward the end. We're bumping right up against the thousand year reign of Christ as king on this earth. We're somewhere down toward the end of the, the time where the harvest is coming in. There's going to be this great last push, this harvest that's going to happen, and then we're going to enter into the kingdom age. Well, one thing you'll find, and I learned this from Brother Hagin years ago, and it's really good. One thing you'll find is that when God's getting ready to birth in a new era or a new age, you'll have a splash over or an intermingling of the two eras or the two ages. It's kind of like the transition seasons that we're in. When we go from winter to spring, we're transitioning in spring into summer. So we get a little winter and we get a little summer at the same time. We've been having a little winter the last few days, and I'm loving every minute of it. Amen? But the day's coming when we'll transition fully into summer, and we're going to have the July and August days. Right? 
So God has got us right now. We, we're born in a time where we're moving toward and into. We're moving out of one place into another. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to be here when Jesus sets up his kingdom. I may die physically, go to heaven, and come back with him when he comes back to this earth. I don't know. I'm not trying to set a timeline tonight. But what I'm telling you is, is that God begins to teach us. You know, John the Baptist preached the same message Jesus did. John, it says, was under the spirit and power of Elijah, the anointing that was upon his life, to prepare the way for that day, that era, that season, when the Lord would come the first time. But John preached the same message. The kingdom of God has come close to you. Repent. Get ready. Get your heart right. Get your eyes open. Get your ears open. Get in a position spiritually where you can see this and understand it and enter into it when it happens. And so you and I are living in a similar time like that where he's going to come and he's going to rule as king. Now, he's going to rule as king, but he's bringing with him, the Bible says, those that are already in heaven, they're coming with him to rule and reign with him. Those that know him on this earth, you and I, we will be changed, amen, into that, that glorified body and into that position, and we're going to have a position of ruling and reigning with him. Yeah. We're not just going to come down here and goof off <laughs> for a thousand years. Amen. So, so he wants us to get a hold of these things because us walking in the dominion and authority and position of who we are spiritually as kings is part of helping to bring this in. There are always people God used to birth in what he was getting ready to do. When it was time for Jesus to be born, he had, uh, what, what's the name of the lady that was interceding all the time? Anna and the guy, Simeon. Anna and Simeon, they spent their lives in the temple interceding and praying for the, the Messiah to be born. They picked up, and I know they did because... When Jesus was eight days old, brought into the temple for circumcision, they knew who he was, a little infant laying there in their hand. Simeon was able to hold him. God had told him, you're going you're gonna to lay your eyes on the Messiah before you die. What a promise. And he's, he's, he's I mean, here's Joseph and Mary. There was no royal lineage. There was no big, you know, natural thing saying this was the Messiah, but they knew what season they were in, and the Holy Spirit had shown them and even led him to the temple, told him to go there now, and when he went there, he held that baby in his hands, and he knew who he was. See, you can just be one of the, the, the herd here in the earth, just kind of what, what, which way is the wind blowing today, or you can understand things from God in what spiritual season you're in and moving into things. Well, we're, getting, we're bumping up against the kingdom season, and God's trying to teach us how to be kings. Yes. He's wanting to teach you how to rule and reign, how he can rule and reign through you. In this earth, amen? And that's why John, this revelation came to John. God's made us kings and priests unto our God. Hallelujah. Uh, okay, where do, I, where do I go? You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says that you and I are to reign in life. We're to reign in life in Christ Jesus. One, one translation of the Bible, that verse is translated, reign in life as kings. Yeah. We're to rule and reign. Jesus won the victory for us, and he got the victory, and he expects us to enforce the victory. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. So let's, let's think about, and most of you in here know the story of David and Goliath. I could turn over there and read a lot of scripture. Let's, let's do turn over there, but I'm just going to uh, point out a couple of scriptures along the way because there's basically three things I believe the Lord wants me to share with you. Go over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 16. I want you to, to be able to see yourself, equate yourself in that king office. David was a type and shadow of Jesus as king. And I could, we don't have time to go into all the scriptures to explain all that, except to say David was a, he was a renaissance man. He was a man before his time. He understood things other people didn't understand in his day. And, you know, he was misunderstood by some people because of that. Yeah. 
But David is a type and shadow. He, he is a king, but he also, when he needed to be, he'd grab the ephod and be a priest. Yeah. Well, that broke all the rules, the religious yeah. rules. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And he also understood... How, you know, worshiping and ministering to the Lord with music. He, he raised up the tabernacle of David. He, he, very, he understood spiritual things in a great way. But one of the things he was a type and shadow of is Jesus the King in heaven ruling. He's the head. Think of Jesus as being the head in heaven. The body is in the earth. We're the body of Christ. And the Bible says you, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, I believe it is, it says you are a member in particular of that body. As Jesus rules as the head from heaven, he rules through you. Plans are formulated in the head, but authority is exercised through the body. That's why when we quit doing our part as kings and priests, and we just kind of go do whatever we want to do, then Jesus, who has all the authority, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the ability, he is hindered by doing anything in the earth because the head doesn't exercise authority. The head tells the body how to exercise the authority. And that's why the devil's always trying to get you to think you're not worthy. You can't do anything. You've blown it and God's done with you or whatever the lie of the day is. Like restaurants have the soup of the day, the devil has the lie of the day. Amen. Praise God. God is... Good to us, isn't he? So there's three things I want you to see here about David that he understood that caused him to defeat the demonic, prophetic lies of the enemy that was... Think about this. This prophetic voice of Goliath and his appearance in the natural realm was causing a whole army of men to be intimidated. The devil was saying, Boo! to King Saul and the army, and they were backing off from it. Amen. Because they didn't understand who they were. David understood who he was. Now, the first key to this being a king is position. You might want to write that word down. Position. You've got to understand who you are. Your position in a matter. Here in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, Maybe that's the Hebrew pronunciation, and maybe it's not. Here in 1 Samuel 16, you know the story how Samuel said, go to Jesse's house, I'm done with Saul, uh, I'm, that's it, the, I'm taking the anointing from him as king, and I'm putting it on someone else. He went to Jesse's house with this horn of oil, and all these sons, all these good-looking, you know, uh, sons of Saul, these big, you know, healthy young men are walking by, and the Holy Ghost is going, nope, not him, nope, not him, nope, not him. He came to the end of all of them, and he, go, and he says, do you have any more sons? He goes, yeah, I got one little guy. He's out here hanging out with the sheep. Didn't even get invited to the, the prophetic party. And there again, we could talk about that too, but we won't. So they go get David. David walks in. Amen. It says, verse 12 here in chapter 16, he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil. I don't know what my pronunciation is about here tonight. <laughs> Some of you pray in tongues for me, so I'll get it right. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And now look, look. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Now, what's what, Spirit of the Lord for what? To anoint him to be a king. As far as God was concerned, from that day forward, he was the king. Yes. Now, it took a long time for things to get worked out and Saul to finally, you know, end up uh, dying because he wouldn't go with the program and so forth and so on. But as far as God was concerned... The, the mantle of king was upon David. He, he was given the position, the spiritual position as king. We just read in Revelation that you now have the spiritual position as a king. When Jesus was seated on that throne, God saw you seated on that throne. 
He gave you, when, he, when you got saved and you entered into Christ, you were baptized or immersed into Jesus, you got everything he got. Now, of course, it has, you have to follow the Holy Spirit. You know, you don't just go out and start trying to rule the world on your own. Amen. But yet there's an element of dominion and authority that God wants you to exercise over the demonic powers that come against you or your family or your city or wherever. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself on this. But you have the position of a king. Say, I'm a king. I'm a king. Say it like you mean it. I am a king. You're not the king, but you are a king that the king is a king over. Better way to explain it may be God, when he created the earth, the Bible says in, in uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. Why? He created it all. He's the owner. But then he said to Adam, I'm giving you dominion over it. I own the planet, but I'm giving you authority. Part of my authority as king to dominate, to rule and to reign and to make decisions on the earth. Yes. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is king, and we're in him, and we have the position of king. David understood that. He received it. You're far more anointed than you know you are. See, we get the anointing, we start, we, we get all kinds of ideas and concepts about, you know, if we feel Holy Ghost goosebumps, we think we're anointed. You're anointed whether you, you may feel like the driest riverbed in the desert of wherever, you may feel that way. That has nothing to do with spiritual truth in your life. Yeah. Amen? Yes. Paul tells us to stir up the gift that's in us. Yeah. Paul tells us to use it on purpose. I found in my life that when I put myself in a position to minister to somebody, that that's the manifestation of the anointing shows up. But I'm anointed all the time. Yeah. When... when uh, uh, Moses' brother Aaron, when God said he's going to be the high priest, they put, they, he told them what garments to make for him. They put them on him. Then they poured this big vial of oil over his head. It went down through his garments, through his beard, all the way down to his feet. He became the anointed high priest. Amen. He was anointed, whether he was over playing checkers with somebody or he was eating, eating food. He was the anointed. He stood in the spiritual office of being the high priest. One time the, the people sinned and the, there, be, there came a, 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 a disease that was killing people from the outside of the camp in. And Moses went to Aaron and he said, grab the, I always forget the name of it, the, the incense thing. What is it, a labor? No, it's not a labor. Censor, the censor. He told him, grab that, put the holy fire from the, the altar on it and the incense on it and run out among the people. In other words, he's telling him, take that anointing that's on you. At, see, high priest was what, what did he do? He stood between God and the people and he made intercession so that people could be accepted of God. So he took that, that incense, which symbolized his praise and worship and honor to God out of the office of high priest and he ran out into the people and when he got to the place where that disease had killed people, it stopped right there. He purposely used the anointing on his life to intercede and intervene in a situation. Yeah. Woo! See, when you realize that when, as you walk around the dera, as you're on your job, part of what God wants you to do is he wants you to take control and rule and reign and dominate that situation for him. When bad things happen, people start acting nuts. Even when you start acting nuts, you need to take dominion and authority over it. You need to step into that place. If you've been invited to be an employee of a, of a company, you, don't, you may not be the head of the company, but that company, you become a part of it, and you have a certain level of authority. When the enemy starts attacking that company, you have the right to step in and tell the devil to take his hands off of it. It's the same thing with your family. People sit around and worry their whole life, hoping one of their relatives will get saved. Take dominion over the enemy. Right. As for me and my household, they'll serve the Lord. Psalm 112 says that the, the seed of the righteous 
We'll all be mighty warriors for God. Break the devil's power. Tell him to take your hands off of my sister. Take your hands off of my child. You have the right as a king to do that. And then pray the light and the life of God. Ask God to send the angels. Ask God to do whatever he needs to do. Ask God to direct them to people that they'll listen to if they won't listen to you because they think they know who you are and they don't. Amen. You've got to get mad at the devil. You can't just, oh, Lord, help, 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 help. You, that, that's not going to get you very far. Do you know anger is, is Okay. Unless it's misused. The Bible doesn't tell us not to ever be angry. It says be angry, but sin not. And it says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't hang on to anger. Be angry for the, angry for the right reason. Jesus never sinned and he was angry at the Pharisees. The Bible says he looked upon them with anger and told them you guys are a bunch of snakes. He wasn't trying to hurt their feelings. He was trying to lo help them be located spiritually so they would repent. God gets angry for a right reason. It's okay to get angry. When you see the devil encroaching on your territory, into your Garden of Eden, into your family, if you don't get angry, there's something wrong with you. But see, we, we, we kind of misunderstand these things, and we teach so much on love and being kind, that if we think, oh, if we get mad, oh, shouldn't do that. It's okay to get angry for the right reasons. Now, if you get angry for the wrong reasons, you have to repent because you can get angry for the wrong reasons, right? But you've been given a position of a king. You know, even King Saul here, who wasn't a very good king, was he? Because God let the people choose the kind of king they wanted. <laughs> Not a good deal. Matter of fact, God never in the scripture refers to Saul as king. He only refers to him as captain because it wasn't his idea for this person to be that. But he refers to David as king. Yeah. Interesting, huh? But even Saul, which had that position, God allowed the prophet of God to give, you know, it, it, there's the, the good, the acceptable and perfect will of God, the Bible talks about. God allowed the people to have this king. He poured oil on his head through Samuel. He was anointed and he became a leader a substitute leader, because the people had to find out that they really didn't want what they wanted. Right. If they got what they wanted, they'd get something like them, and they needed to repent as a nation. Yeah. And so Saul went out, but the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He got angry and went out and destroyed his enemies. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. He got angry at the Philistines, and he went out and destroyed them. Yeah. Why? Because he had the anointing to do so. The Spirit of the Lord partnered with him in anger. Yeah. Now, I'm not giving you a license to go pick a fight with your spouse tonight. Come on, are you here? Or whoever's serving you at the store tomorrow or whatever. But what I'm talking about, you know, really it should be the opposite. When we see people so tormented by the devil that they're acting out. Or, you know, they're just being, acting like a jerk. Instead of immediately going to the flesh level and looking at the person... What we need to do is go after the devil that's harassing them and tell him to take his hands off of them and speak peace. I command peace to come to that situation. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Position. You have, you're a king. Romans 5.17 says that we're to reign in life. We're to rule and reign in life. Amen. Amen. Now, so you, you, you have that position. Now, the next thing is place. This story, this... We're using as an analogy here tonight with David. David had the anointing on him, and he ended up through a, a series of events coming to that place where the battle was being fought. Go ahead and turn with me over to uh, uh, chapter 17 and look at verse 1. This is where the battle was at, and David had arrived with the, the bread for his brothers and all of this, and they had had this 40-day standoff with Goliath. Verse 1 in chapter 17 says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Soko, is really the way you pronounce that, which belongeth to Judah. The land, the place, belonged to the tribe of Judah. The land was divided up among the twelve tribes through Joshua, and David was from the tribe of Judah. 
Judah. This giant, this demonic manifestation, this false prophetic soothsaying being was standing on his territory that belonged to him. So not only do you need a position as a king, but you need to understand that there's a place on this earth that God has intended for you to have as an inheritance and he intends for you to defend your ground and to kick anything or anyone out of it that is going to try to turn it into something other than what it ought to be. Glory. Amen. 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 See, I didn't come, my family, we didn't come to Madeira in 1983 because we thought it would be a good idea. We did the best we could to try to follow the Spirit of God. And as I look back now, He helped us in mercy and grace. And He brought us to Madeira and planted us here and had us you know, start the church and all, do all the things we do here. And this town now belongs to me. Right. I'm not saying I'm the only one. If, you, if you've been called here and you're supposed to be here, it belongs to you too. Right. Hallelujah. What goes on in your house, on your property... Is your either your fault <laughs> or it's, it's your blessing because you're, you're allowing the right things to go on. I'm telling you, God's into real estate. It's a big deal with him. I didn't used to think that. I thought that was a bunch of hooey. <laughs> but God had to re-educate me and help me see how ignorant I was about that. Think about it. It's all a battle over who's going to rule and reign on the earth. What's going on over in Israel right now around the Temple Mount is because the devil knows that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom right on that mountain right there, and he's trying to, he's fighting over that ground. He's got the whole world almost in de deception, or a lot of people in the world anyway, in deception. He's got them twisted around in their minds somehow that Israel shouldn't be there, but yet the scriptures say that in the, the last days, after many years of being dispersed across the earth because of the rejection of Jesus Christ, they would, God would bring them back, put them in their land, they'd begin to prosper, and flourish there and then eventually the Messiah would come back and say see the devils he understands where we're at in the timeline he understands the prophetic time we're in and so he's trying to destroy Israel get Israel out of there stop that whole thing from happening because he knows that they have to be there in order for Jesus to come back and for them to recognize him as Messiah and for him to set up his kingdom so that's what all of this stuff's about with Israel People, the devil frames it in all kinds of different ways and tries to make it look like nothing but a social issue. But see, God knows what he's doing. He owns this earth. And if he decided to give you a piece of ground tomorrow and told you that, that's his business, nobody else's. He came to Abraham 4,000 years ago. And he said, leave this place here, this piece of ground here, Ur of the Chaldees, leave this place that's been given over to idol worship and demonic worship and go and I'll show you where you're going to go. And when you get there and he took him into Canaan and he began to talk to him over time and began to show him, I'm giving you this land. It's going to belong to you and you're the seed, the seed that will come out of you. And they're going to leave the land for 400 years, but they're going to grow into an army, and then they're going to come back, and I'm going to give them this land forever. You know, Abraham was past the age of, of giving birth to children. His wife was past the age, and God comes to him and says, you know, I'm going to give you a son, and I'm going to give you the land. And God, Abraham, for whatever reason, didn't have any problem with the son part. Because he didn't, he didn't say anything about it. But he says, how do I know the, the land's going to be mine? God says, go get these sacrifices and offer them. Make a blood covenant with me. Because a blood covenant meant God was swearing on his own being that he would perform, it was for Abraham, really, that he would perform what he said or he would have to destroy himself. That's the kind of commitment God's made to us through the blood of his son. Don't ever let the devil tell you that what the blood paid for for you is not going to happen. Amen. And so you know the story how he offered these sacrifices and he, you know, he had to fight off the birds of the air and all this and how that the God came down and manifested himself in a bur as a burning lamp and a smoking furnace and passed between the pieces, which was something that they did in making covenant in those days with each other as they walked that trail of blood through the, the bodies that were split in half. They walked the trail of blood in that in a figure eight pattern 
which figure eight uh, in the number eight in the Bible is symbolic of new beginnings. It's also symbolic of heaven and earth intersecting and the flow between heaven and earth, what God's doing and you're doing intersecting and working together. God gave him that land. And I don't care how many, you know, we read the Bible, we know that in the last days the Antichrist is going to rally pretty much the whole earth. They're going to attack Israel, and they're actually going to uh, possess Jerusalem for a very, very short period of time. And then all heaven's going to break loose. All heaven's going to break loose. And if you think it's bad when all hell breaks loose, where do you see what all heaven breaking loose is about? Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. So it's about a place. If God puts you in a neighborhood, and that's where you live, that's your neighborhood. I like what Larry Huggins, see, Larry Huggins understands this. Brother Larry Huggins, a prophet that comes to our church. He says, because his ministry, his calling is to go all over the world to different churches, different cities, and minister. And he has an he a, a, a international mantle of God on him to go and to impart things and to you know, bless the people and help people in those areas through that anointing that's on his life. And I heard him say this. You've probably heard it, too, if you were here. He said, when I go into a city, I become the mayor. <laughs> he doesn't come in and live for a while and have people vote him in office. He understood, understands I've got an authority if I'm sent to this place. If the people of God, see, when we as a church invite him and ask him to come in and open up to the prophetic ministry, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own house and his own company. And the Bible says if you receive a prophet as a prophet, you get his reward. What's his reward? The anointing that, that flows through him and the blessing and the mantle of God. So when we invite somebody like Larry Huggins in and we receive from heaven that which God wants to flow through and that gift and that mantle on his life, then he comes in and with authority and dominion, he begins to minister those things. And Larry understands that I have a right, I'm anointed, to rule and reign in that place because I've been welcomed in. Remember Jesus' home synagogue? When he went in there and tried to preach, he wasn't welcomed. And it says he couldn't do anything there. Brother Hagin used to say, no preacher can go any farther in a service than the congregation will let him. If people put the brakes on you spiritually, you can feel it if you're under the anointing. You feel like your words are a rubber ball hitting that wall and coming back and hitting you between the eyes. But when people are receiving, it's almost like you're not there. It's just like a river's running through you and you're a pipeline and you're just kind of letting it happen. And I just want you to know that many of the guest speakers that come to our, our church have told me it's so easy to preach here. They said, your people receive. Your people, you know, Brother Larry... Huggins, he said it this way one time. He says, I like to go where I'm celebrated, not tolerated. Right. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. So anyway, there's a place. Everybody say a place. Yes. Now, God has, you know, Ephesians 2.6 says that, that we've been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places. A place. In Christ Jesus. God sees you seated on that throne of glory, is what the Bible calls it, in Christ, and Jesus is seated there as a king, and he's ruling over, over heaven, earth, and hell. He has complete and absolute dominion. He said that when he rose from the dead. All power has been given to me in heaven and earth. And that word power means might and right over heaven and earth. So you have a place in Jesus you have the position of king, but you have a place in him and what he rules over and has dominion over. If you yield to him and his spirit directs you, you have, as a king, dominion and authority over. That's why you don't ever have to fear any devil or any demon. Oh, did you hear the witches are praying against the president? whoop de do Wait till the Christians start praying for the president and exercise the authority and the dominion that God's given them to shut down demonic power. Yeah. See, if the devil starts manifesting in your neighborhood, he starts bringing drug dealers in there, people start shooting at each other, things start happening, you know, kids start getting on drugs or whatever, don't go out and start shooting back. Start shooting in the spirit. Matter of fact, you don't even need a gun, all you need is a sword. 
the sword of God's word. Take authority over that. You're not doing that in my neighborhood, devil. This is my neighborhood. This is the land God's given me. This is the place he put me in. I take authority over you, and I command you to cease and desist right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you to send angels, warring angels if need be, to come against the principalities that are ruling over these people. Now, Father, I pray for those drug dealers. I want to see them saved. I want to see them live out the purpose of God. I don't want to see them die young and go to hell and all that kind of stuff. So you pray for them, but you also exercise dominion against the enemy. You don't just let it go on. Shandai, you have a place. Praise God. Hallelujah. And that place, there again, in the spirit, it's in heaven, in Jesus. See, we don't, we don't do these things from down here, up there. We do it from up there, down here. Yes. Amen. You need to speak from heaven. And the last thing, and let me just close this down here. Come in for a landing. Amen. You have position, you have place, and you have power. Power. Go ahead and say the word power. power. It won't hurt you. Amen. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 1. I know you know these things, but we need to be reminded. Right. Peter wrote and he said, I, I'm stirring you up about the present day truth. Basically, you already know this stuff, but I just need to tell it to you again and stir you up in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Power. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Jesus said this. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father's put in his own power. In other words, there's some things that are going to happen down here. I'm amazed how many people get on the internet and say, Jesus is coming back in September. No, he's not. Just because you said that, he's not. No man knows the day or the hour. Quit worrying about all that stuff. Who the Antichrist is and all that. Forget all of that. He'll be revealed when he needs to be revealed. See, the enemy wants us to focus on that stuff so we don't do what we're supposed to be doing every day like Britain and Priscilla have been doing. He wants to distract us. Amen. And then we get in these big fights and strife and unforgiveness and you know, calling each other names, whatever. He says, but, verse 8, but you shall receive what? Power. 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 This word is the word dynamis or dunamis in the Greek. And it means self-generated, explosive, dynamic power. Yes. It's where we get our word dynamite from. Yes. We've got the power to blow the devil out of a situation. Yes. You see, a king, I'm talking to you tonight, a king, the anointing of the king, and you've heard me say it before, they are anointed to protect and provide. That's their job in a nation is they are to make sure they have an army, they have everything they need to protect the nation from the enemies and a system of government and a system of commerce and so forth, agriculture, whatever, so the people's needs are met. They are to rule and reign over that system. They are to see to it that their kingdom prospers as they stand against the enemies and as they provide. You have an anointing in you to cause this city, your family, yourself to flourish, to prosper, to have victory over the devil. Yes. You're anointed as a king to be that and do that. Yes. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Holy Ghost will come on you. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you shall be a witness. You shall be witnesses unto me. Now this word witnesses, it doesn't somebody who's, mean somebody who's passing gossip around. When you see the word witness, see, see there again, these things were written from a, a Jewish understanding, a Hebrew, a Hebraic understanding. And so when Jesus said this to these Jewish men who were raised up under the law of Moses and understood who he was as Messiah, when he said witnesses to them, what they heard was this. I will have the power, the Holy Spirit will come upon me and empower me to say something or do something and to testify about what Jesus did at the cross for us, and that will make the power and ability available to do again what he did already for us. Yeah. See, the Bible says, 
By his stripes, when blood flowed out of his body, the price was paid for our healing. So when we preach that message, when we witness that message, when we testify of that message, that brings what happened 2,000 years ago and was established spiritually in, in eternity forever, that brings that into this present day and makes it available for that person who needs it, the power for them to be healed. A king is empowered. Yes. See, that's why David, when Goliath started saying, oh, you're sending a kid out at me with sticks, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air. And David said, <laughs> I love David. David said, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to destroy the army this day. And I'm going to, you know, and he, just t he began to tell him what he was going to do. Why? Because he knew. It wasn't because he said, man, I've been practicing for the last 10 days, and I can hit a fly on the wall with this thing. It wasn't about that. It was about he knew I'm the king. I'm a king. And this guy is, try, is on my territory trying to destroy my kingdom, my people. They don't know I'm their king yet, but they're going to. Amen? He was smart enough not to open up his mouth. You know, when his big brother started criticizing him and telling him he shouldn't be there and trying to tell him, you're just here to see blood, he looked at him and he says, is there not a cause? And you look up that word in the Hebrew, that word, I think it's D-A-B-A-R, Dabar. It means, what he was saying to his brother is, hey, Jack, you were there when they poured oil on my head. You know who I am in the spirit. And you know what a king's anointed to do. You're not ignorant of these things. And so the reason, I'm here for that reason, not what you're trying to tell me I'm here for. Right. It's amazing how many people know how your life ought to be, but they can't figure their own out. Right. Amen? Praise God. The Bible tells us when we're able to get the log out of our eye, we have the right then to help somebody get the speck out of theirs. Yeah. Moving right along since that went over real big. Amen? So the power was there. David understood. David could have, he could have thrown that rock straight up in the air and it would have knocked Goliath in the head. Because it was the anointing that was upon him. It wasn't the fact that he was even throwing a rock. It was the fact that he was moving forward in his anointing and the authority, and he was prophesying the future to the enemies of God. Yeah. You know, in Israel, if you study, you'll find that before they used to make war, they'd get the prophet, the priest, and the king together. And they would consult how to go about making war. And each one of them had a different role. The prophet could hear from the Lord and say, don't go over there and fight. Go over here and fight. Meet them over here, not over there, or something like that. The priest could handle any issues that would keep God from helping them fight. If there needed to be sacrifices offered, if there needed to be repentance, the priest could intercede and pray and so forth. But the king is the one that went out and got the job done. Yeah. Amen? Amen? David, the David and Bathsheba story. That's, it says that in the springtime, when you read that, it said in the springtime when kings should have been out doing what they're supposed to be doing, winning battles and winning wars. David decided not to act like a king that spring. Got him in problems. So you and I are kings. What, what Brent and Priscilla did in that, the restaurant and in that shoe store today was be kings. They listened to the Holy Ghost. The devil was tormenting this woman that God had created. The devil on their territory in Madeira was trying to take ground, trying to establish a stronghold in that family and in that life. He was doing, all the, he was doing the same thing that uh, Goliath did. He was prophesying to this woman and beating her up with his words. And they, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, stepped up and they put a stop to that. Yeah. They gave her relief. They helped her by the power of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. No wonder Jesus said, occupy until I come. Yes. That word occupy, you look it up in the original. It means like an, a, 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 a force, an army that goes in, defeats another army, takes control of the land and the, and the country, and they become the police force. They become the law in that land. Jesus said, go out and take the ground. Go out and take what I send you to, to take authority over it and occupy it until I come back. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen? Right. 
So you've got position, you've got a place, and you have got the power to do the job. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, let the Holy Ghost show you who to pick it with. <laughs> Amen. This help you tonight? Yes. See, the enemy attacks people, and the first thing they do is panic. <gasps> oh, no, what am I going to do? David didn't panic. He got ticked off. Who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? Devil, what do you think you're doing on my territory? What do you think you're doing attacking my sister with fear? Or my brother over there with drugs? What do you think you're doing? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, you don't have any right to do that. Well, the devil says, well, well he, he, he let me in and he wants me in. I don't care what he wants. He's stupid right now. He's blind. He's ignorant. He's deceived. And so I'm going after you, and I'm going to pray the angels of God and the power of God into the situation, and I'm going to pray for him and protect him until the light bulb can come on. Yeah. Kenneth Hagin, I'll, I'll close with this. Kenneth Hagin's brother was lost, and, and Brother Hagin would witness to him, witness to him, witness to him, and he never changed for years and years and years. And he said one day he was laying on the bed preparing to preach one night, and he was meditating the scriptures, and he meditated on that scripture over there, and I think it's in 2 Corinthians where it says, if, if their eyes, if the people of this world are, are uh, blinded, it's because the God of this world has blinded their minds. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine in unto them. And he said, I saw it. He said, Jesus has already paid the price for my brother to be saved. He said, what needs to happen is the blindness needs to come off of his eyes. And he said, I just stood up off the bed, took my Bible and lifted it up and said, I break the power of spiritual darkness and blindness off of my brother's eyes. You demonic spirits, take your hands off of him in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that the light of the gospel begins to shine in unto him. Within two weeks, his brother was saved. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. See, there's some things that will change just because we go in and change them with the authority of the king anointing that's on our life. Yes. And there's some things that will never change unless you do. I don't know about you, but I'm going to do the best I can. I'm not getting into some arrogant look at me thing. But you know, there's a difference between being prideful and bold. We've had so much of the opposite of boldness in the church, trying to be goody two-shoes Christians, that when somebody actually gets bold, we think they're being prideful. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when nobody's even chasing them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Just stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Because it is truth that sets us free. Lord, I pray tonight that these things that your word teaches us, these examples you've given us through David, Lord, David got it right. He wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. He messed up. He had to repent, just like we do in our lives. But, Father, your word says that you said he's a man after my own heart. He's the one I'm using as the type and shadow of my son in his king, uh, uh, Messiah ministry. And you thought so much of, of him and his heart that you said, David, I'm, make, I'm giving you something called the sure mercies of David. I am never going to allow the throne to be without one of your lineage. <clears throat> and Lord, as we study the word, we see that Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. That he is now seated on the throne of his father David. He is now ruling and reigning in the completed work that he's accomplished. And Father, you have called us to rule and reign with him. So we thank you, Father, for that privilege tonight. Lord, I pray that you will quicken your people this week and into the future. Lord, help them to see this from your perspective. When the enemy is encroaching on their families or encroaching on their own spirit solar body or encroaching uh, in, in some place, God, that you've ordained uh, here in Madeira. As we look at buildings, as we look at, at land, Father, may we say, I command that this land fulfill the, the God-ordained purpose for it. I command that what happens on this land will be what God has ordained in the name of Jesus. We thank you for Madeira, Lord. We refuse to let demons rule and reign in this community. 
This place will be known, as you've already shown us, as a place of the glory. It'll be known as a place, as a, a city of refuge. People will come here for refuge from the darkness. And they'll receive the light. And they'll be healed. And they'll be blessed. And they'll be helped. We thank you that this fellowship you've given us is a hospital, God. We thank you for all the other churches, all the other pastors and ministries, all the callings that are here, God. We need them. We need them to walk in the fullness of what you've given them to be in this community. So we praise you for them. We thank you for them. We ask you, Lord, just to download revelation to the pastors and, and the ministries and minister to them and bring them into the fullness of what they are to be. For we're in this together, praise God. Help us to be the, that one, Father, that, that one, uh, that unity that you have for us, that one accord, Father, in Jesus' name, that your will might be done in Madera, California, in California itself, and across this nation and world. We thank you for what you've given us, Father. We honor you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week this week. Go rule and reign.